Sofa Grady, who's not only an organizer, writer, and youth worker, but also a lecturer at uh, King's College London. Before we get started, I want to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. I am Aaron Zubia of the Department of Politics and International Affairs, and this lecture today is the second this fall in the Total Program Signature Course and <coughs> Lecture Series, which this year is on the revolutionary spirit and the human future. The total program exists to sponsor serious and open engagement with the moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. And if you are looking for a genuine liberal education, uh, while you are at Furman, then the total program is for you. The total program sponsors courses in the history of political thought and oversees the Society of Total Fellows, a select group of students chosen by competitive application. Social Fellows meet several times a year to discuss contemporary political issues in light of the perspective that is gained through the sustained study of political philosophy. The Tokyo program also works closely with the Political Thought Club, an independent student group that meets every Friday at 4 p.m. And there we discuss great texts that pertain to the study of politics. If you are interested in reading these kinds of texts together, then please do join us at Fridays at 4. The Tokyo program's vibrant intellectual community here on campus is made possible by the generous gifts of individuals and philanthropic organizations. And I want to thank our sponsors, Jenny and Sandy McNeil, Beth and Ravenel Curry, the AWC Foundation, the family of Jane Gage Hip, the Strata Education Network, and many others, including former students who support the Tokyo program. The theme of this year's course and lecture series is the revolutionary spirit in the human future. Populism, the pandemic, resurgent socialism have recently brought Americans to ask revolutionary questions, to reconsider the nation's founding narrative and its very identity, past and future. In this course and lecture series, we ask how should our country's revolutionary origins inform our self understanding in this moment that portends radical change? We will ponder the causes and the consequences of the revolu revolutionary spirit as it has developed in America and elsewhere since 1776. Now we have with us today, Sofa Graydon, who teaches politics and international relations at King's College London. Sofa is the co-author of Prefigurative Politics, Building Tomorrow Today. Sofa's research focuses on egalitarian forms of organizing, whether in global trade or in local community groups. In addition to Sofa's teaching and research, so as a community organizer, a youth worker, and a public speaker. And we're very excited about having Sofa here to talk to us about the theory and the practice of prefigurative politics and to give a defense of the idea that creating a new society within the shell uh, of the old, what might this look like in the West today? While we wish Sofa could be here with us in person, we are glad that technology permits us to welcome Sofa virtually. Please give, uh, join me in giving a warm, firm, and welcome the sofa great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very honored to join you at Furman, uh, even if it is electronically. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to Aaron for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. Um, yeah, so revolution and social change. Um, usually when we think about these topics, we tend to envisage people on the street, people with weapons, lots of shouting, lots of chaos. Uh, we tend to envisage uh, taking over control of the state that tends to be the center of revolutionary activity. Um, but prefigurative politics is something much, much more anarchist than that. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, it's, it's basically being the change you want to see, uh, practicing what you preach, uh, starting where you stand, um, creating a new world in the shell of the, of the old, uh, as, as Aaron just mentioned as well. Uh, it's a pretty simple idea at heart. I'm sure most of us at some point have thought this thought or had, had this idea that if we don't like something in the world right now, 
we can go out and we can be the best alternative to that that we know and that we're capable of. Uh, and that is exactly what prefigurative politics is. So I, I want to investigate a little bit further this idea of being the change you want to see. Um, although I also want to point out that prefigurative politics is a specific term. It's much more specific than, than just the general idea of being the change you want to see. Uh, it, it is embedded in and attached to a particular philosophical and political activist social movement uh, tradition. Uh, so what I want to do here today is to talk a little bit about the history of the concept and the traditions that it's kind of emerged out of, and therefore that it has been hugely inf influenced by. Uh, I want to go through some of the main uh, underlying assumptions of this notion that you can change through uh, society through being the change you want to see. Uh, and talk about some strengths and limitations of that sort of approach um, to, to revolution. Um, so the, the moment that I first learned about the concept of prefigurative politics, uh, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, I was on my doing my field work for my PhD. Uh, and I was in uh, this building here, which is a very, very exciting building from a prefigurative perspective. I will admit it might not look like much. Um, it looks like a pretty standard apartment block, um, but it is uh, located in Hamburg in Germany. And uh, this building, I dare say, is structurally different from most other buildings in Hamburg, if not in the rest of the Western world. Uh, structurally different physically, sure, but even more importantly so, politically and the way that it's organized. Uh, I was staying in, in this building in a flat just up here on the, on the left. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, it kind of looked like a hotel room. Didn't look like much, to be honest. So it's sort of empty, new looking. I was sitting in there. I was uh, doing some reading about anarchist uh, you know, revolutionary strategy, uh, which is when I, I came upon the concept of prefigurative politics as a name for, for the kind of approach to, to revolution that I had long been interested in. And I think what makes this building so different is um, it is not privately owned by anyone. There is no landlord for this building. Uh, it, it is uh, built by a collective of about 20 different families who came together in the late 90s uh, to pool all of their resources, get a mortgage together and build this building as a housing cooperative. So the people who own the property are the people who live in the apartments of the property. Uh, most of the apartments are pretty small uh, but at the bottom right there, you can't really see it in this picture, there is a, a big social space where people can cook meals together and there is a, a place to do film screenings and discussion groups and things like that. Um, but apart from that, it's pretty much a standard uh, living space, a standard space where about 20 different families live. Um, but I, I, I say that this is structurally different uh, because it has a completely different ownership structure a completely different structure of finance and a completely different decision-making structure uh, from how most normal apartment buildings work, where you have profit-interested developers who will invest, uh, build the property, and then charge rents that are as high as possible uh, to, to basically make a profit uh, off of the tenants who, who live in the property. Uh, the reason why I was in Hamburg for my field work was because I was studying um, this uh, coffee trader sounds a bit random, but I was uh, doing my PhD on uh, international trade and how to overcome colonial patterns in international trade. I was studying a cooperative, you will hear me say this word quite a lot today, I think, uh, based in Hamburg, uh, that imports coffee, uh, roasts it, and sells it on to different cooperatives and other places too across uh, Europe. And they do so in an egalitarian and democratic way. And the coffee they sell and roast comes from the Zapatistas in the Chiapas region of Mexico, uh, who are an autonomous uh, society, you could say, about 300,000 uh, largely indigenous uh, people who have basically set up their own government uh, as an alternative to uh, the Mexican federal government that they 
um, didn't want to support and that wasn't pr promoting their interests. So I was kind of sitting in this nexus of, of all of these prefigurative institutions and organizations um, when I first learned about the, about the concept. And I think it gives you quite a good overview uh, of what prefigurativism is all about. Uh, so I went on to uh, a few years later, write, start, start working on this book together with my friend and colleague, Paul Rakestard. Um, and uh, we ended up titling it simply uh, Prefigurative Politics uh, with the subtitle of Building Tomorrow Today as a way to try to summarize what we're talking about. Uh, we also got the publishers to make this lovely picture, which quite <laughs> physically illustrates what we're trying to show. Uh, and one of the key tasks uh, in the book was to first of all figure out what prefigurative politics is. And uh, unfortunately, as long and complicated as the word prefigurative is, the definition is unfortunately even longer. Uh, but it goes like this. Prefigurative politics is the deliberate experimental implementation of desired future social relations and practices in the here and now. So uh, that's to narrow down a little bit the general uh, approach to social change of being the change that you want to see. But as I mentioned, uh, prefigurative politics is not just kind of an abstract term. It exists very much embedded in a particular tradition. And to simplify it a little bit, I would say that there are roughly three different uh, social movement and theory traditions that have fed into uh, the concept of prefigurative politics. And uh, they are uh, feminism, anti-colonialism and racism, and anarcho-communism. Um, so let me explain a little bit what I, what I mean by these three. So feminism, of course, uh, the movement for gender equality, especially uh, I'm referring to the second wave of feminism in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, what was, I think, particularly uh, characteristic of feminism in this era uh, was its emphasis on inequalities that happen outside of the official government sphere. So in the first wave of feminism around the turn of the last century, uh, we saw, of course, increasing um, civil rights for women. We saw voting rights uh, in many countries. Um, so many formal rights had already been won, but by the 1960s and 70s, um, the focus started to be put onto uh, informal forms of inequality. Uh, you will probably recognize the feminist slogan, the personal is political, uh, which put its, fin its finger on exactly this uh, this idea. Um, so the person that is, is political is, I think, a key assumption of prefigurative politics. Doesn't really make sense without it. Uh, I will explain a little bit more in detail um, shortly. So, so that's a kind of theory contribution of feminism. But practically, of course, there have been a lot of prefigurative um, organizations and initiatives from the feminist movement. Uh, there has been a lot of educational programs that are egalitarian. There have been um, consciousness raising groups where women and people of other genders as well uh, come together and share in insights about how society works on a really egalitarian and sort of mutually uh, respectful uh, level, quite different from uh, what academia was like at that time. Um, so there are many uh, sort of organizational practices uh, that we get from feminism as well. So the second main strand is anti-colonialism and anti-racism. And I mean, there's so much to say here, but I think anti-colonialism in, in particular, is like a movement that has been struggling against these really, really overpowering occupational forces. Um, so we can learn a lot from um, coming up with a variety of uh, forms of resistance, right? When you're, when you're faced with violence and, and domination. Uh, one example that I particularly like that we talk about in the book uh, is from India uh, when it was uh, occupied by, by Britain in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Um, there was a university or a college. It's actually a university today. It's changed a lot, quite a lot since then today. Um, but it was a college founded by a thinker who was actually a poet as well. And he happened to win the Nobel Prize. His name is Rabindranath Tagore. I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, but he founded this college as a reaction to the 
very exclusionary, very hierarchical, very dehumanizing um, education that the British occupational forces uh, were offering, shall we say, to the uh, indigenous population in the West Bengal area where he lived. Uh, and not being happy with this quite dehumanizing form of education based on rote learning, based on uh, learning a particular skill so that you could become exploitable in the in the local textile industry. Um, Tagore and the people he was organizing with uh, decided to do something about it by creating the change they wanted to see. They created a college that was inclusive to local people that taught in the language that they knew and that taught a variety of different skills and subjects. Uh, and there was democratic decision making uh, in the college as well. So really quite a different type of college from what the British were offering. Um, theoretically, we can also learn a lot from this strand of thought, uh, has fed into the prefigurative concept. Um, I think the most key one is, I'm going to mention it a bit later on, is about intersectionality. Basically the idea that oppression and the obstacles that we see to equality today are far, far more complex than traditional socialists uh, have tended to assume. You know, they have been very much based on a class analysis and therefore the solution according to state socialists have been quite simple, that as long as you can break the class relationship, in other words, as long as you, as the working class can take control over the state and nationalize industry so that you get rid of the exploitative relationship uh, between owner and worker, then you're basically done. And, and things will follow on from there. Everything else will work out fine uh, from there. But anti-colonialism especially has shown us that we can't really simplify things in that way. Uh, it is not just the class relationship itself that is the obstacle to equality in society. Uh, it is much more than that as well. It is colonialism, uh, it is racism, it is uh, you know, an intersectional, uh, which we'll talk about later, an intersectional array of social structures. Uh, finally, anarcho-communism, uh, which is um, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, strand of influence that has become, I think, most documented in Western academia because it simply has had access to Western academia much more. Um, so anarcho-communism is a kind of alternative to state socialism. Uh, the most famous, I think, uh, clash between anarcho-communism and state socialism is during the first international uh, you know, it was this federal organization back in the late 1800s uh, where socialists from all over the world, really, mostly Europe and Russia, but uh, socialists from all over the world uh, came together and tried to create an international unified front because they were serious about trying to get a communist revolution on an international scale. This was in the 1860s. Um, now, it turned out that people within the international disagreed about exactly what strategy to use and disagreed about exactly what aims they wanted in the shorter term. So there was this huge split between, on the one hand, the Marxists, and Marx himself indeed was, I would say, the, probably the single most influential activist and thinker within the first international, um, who argued that the most important thing was to capture the state right, in different countries. And from then on, you could nationalize industry and change things from the, kind of the top down. Um, and on the other hand, you had Bakunin and a bunch of anarchists who were very, very skeptical, very critical of this idea, who did not think that the state could help us in any way, uh, but rather the way that we create change is through what we would now call prefigurative politics. They argue that we can't possibly create an egalitarian society if we don't organize in a way that is egalitarian now. So they were in favor of uh, starting uh, health services, education services, workplaces that were democratically organized. There was a huge clash within this organization, the First International. And uh, we know from the writing of history and the many horrific, tragic events that have occurred, um, which side won. And, and we know how it, how it went, as it were. Um, all of this is uh, documented and, and discussed in uh, the first paper that, or two actually, the first two papers that ever used the term prefigurative in the particular sense that we know it today. 
and that was written by the US scholar Carl Boggs. Uh, I say his name in a very British way, I should say, Boggs, probably. Um, he wrote these two papers in 1977 uh, that were basically haranguing like massive critique of the Marxist way of organizing, the Marxist side of the First International. Uh, Marx had famously said, you know, we don't want to uh, tell future societies how to be. There's a famous quote from Marx, quote from Marx where he says, uh, we shouldn't be writing recipes for the restaurants of the future. So he was, Marx was very, very opposed uh, to creating what he called utopian ideas, blueprints for the future. He thought the important thing is in, in the here and now uh, to seize control of the state, right? And to nationalize industry. That was uh, the core strategic point for him and for Lenin and for Mao and for most of the people who were influenced by Marx. So Karl Boggs's articles very heavily criticized this idea. He thought that it was just bound, it, it, bound to fail, right? And we can see from arguably from, from how history panned out, um, these movements that were just focused on seizing control of the state and who didn't want to you know, write recipes for the restaurants of the future, um, they ended up reproducing pretty much exactly what they were against. They ended up becoming hierarchical, oppressive, violent, regimes, uh, hardly uh, what anyone who's serious about the term would call communism. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where the concept comes from and, and that's how it's developed and those are the main uh, ideas that it's been shaped by. Um, so I now want to get a little bit more technical and I want to take the term of prefigurative politics with both of its definition and its traditions and try to use this metaphorical prism to figure out what are its main constituent parts. Uh, of course, if we did that seriously, then we wouldn't, I couldn't possibly talk about everything right here. We have to narrow it down quite a lot. But I, I think there are three main assumptions or preconditions, pre, you know, preconstitutive assumptions that uh, prefigurative politics tends to make of the world. And I would, again, simplify them uh, as the following. First of all, the assumption that power is or should be dispersed in society. Second of all, the importance of praxis. And thirdly, intersectionality, as I mentioned before. So those are the three things that I think really make prefigurative politics distinct from other uh, social, well, socialist strategies for revolution. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by, by these three. Let's start with uh, power being dispersed. So really this, uh, and, and by the way, I should say this comes from, this links in very much with the uh, feminist idea that the personal is political that I mentioned before. Um, and really the, the idea of dispersed power, I mean that in two different senses. Um, First of all, it means that in, in a contemporary liberal society like the US or the UK or Sweden, where I'm from originally, um, power and decision making is really not as centralized in the state as people tend to think that it is. OK, so power is actually much more dispersed throughout society than people tend to assume. So therefore, if you were to seize control of the state and change what the state does, that doesn't mean that you've therefore changed society. It can do something, but it can't do as much as state socialists have tended to think. Um, but it also means, secondly, it also means uh, that were socialists uh, somehow to take control of the state and to become the government, um, if they try to seek radical change uh, fr from the top down, kind of coming out from the states, uh, then they would no longer be able to be creating a socialist society. They would have to, as Boggs uh, argued, completely turn on and completely go back on uh, the core principles of what socialism means. Uh, again, let me explain what I mean. So uh, if you're a state socialist and you assume that the core strategy that leads you to socialist revolution is by taking control of the state, 
uh, or other uh, key institutions in society, like large corporations, for example. If we dig into that and scratch the surface of that strategy a little bit, we kind of find an assumption that power lies with elite institutions, or it lies with the states, or it lies with large corporations. Or if we want to get more analytical, we can say that the, the power lies in the relations of the means of production. If there are any Marxists out there who know what I mean by that, if not, don't worry. Um, but the assumption is kind of that you have uh, a core centralized elite institution like the state or a corporation and power sort of emanates from there out into the rest of society. So the government makes a decision and people do according to the, de the decision. Uh, in the form of, uh, in, in the case of socialism, the decision can be something like um, all the uh, means of production uh, will be owned by the workers. Okay, so they make a formal uh, decision like that. And then that kind of emanates out into the rest of society and everyone becomes equal because they're now owners of the means of production. Prefigurative politics has a very, very different understanding of power from this. Rather, I would illustrate it more like this, like in the circle on the right. So sure, there are power centers. So what the government does, does make a difference. Uh, what large corporations do does make a difference. But if power is green in this uh, illustration, uh, there is a lot of power that happens outside of those power centers, outside of those nodes, right? So even if you change a law or if you change a relationship, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've changed all of society. Um, so let me take an example, even uh, if I think about myself as a teacher, right? Um, I'm a teacher, I'm one of the green nodes of, of the university, if we were to uh, think of the university as a, one of these circles. You know, I'm part of the authority uh, of the university in relation to my students. Um, and I can tell my students, you have to turn up to every class and you have to do the reading and that is how you get good grades. Okay, and I have all sorts of power behind me with that because I can actually penalize them and give them a low grade if they don't do all the reading and don't come up, uh, turn up to all of the seminars. Uh, problem is, does that mean that they do the reading and turn up to the seminars? No, sadly not, because I simply don't have that sort of overbearing power over them. Uh, even in this lecture now, I think, uh, you know, I'm standing here talking, words are coming out of my mouth, a lot of them. <laughs> and they're going into your brain. And it's not like I can control what happens to my words in your brain. You know, you kind of do something to them yourself. They link in with all the memories you have and all the thoughts that you have. And each of us in this room is creating a different form, a different version of the words that I'm saying. I'm sure you all have different opinions about it, different feelings about it. You know, so it's not like I can control how you're going to interpret something that I'm saying. I simply don't have that kind of power. Uh, I potentially could get that sort of power uh, if I use a lot of manipulation, uh, but that would probably not lead to a very nice situation. It would probably not lead to a very nice relationship. Uh, and it certainly wouldn't lead to a socialist or communist kind of relationship uh, where power is dispersed equally between us. Um, yeah, so this is a key idea, a key assumption of prefigurative politics. Uh, power both is in the contemporary democratic societies, liberal democratic societies, dispersed, and it should be dispersed, even more dispersed uh, in a communist society. Okay. Um, secondly, I wanted to talk about praxis. Praxis is really just a fancy word for practicing your theory in real life. Obviously a very key idea to prefigurative politics, which is about being the change you want to see. Uh, praxis is a concept that has actually a deep history within socialism and within Marxist theory. Marx himself ironically used this term quite a lot in a slightly different way though. Um, but um, the centrality of praxis to prefigurative politics um, means something quite different from the rest of socialism. Uh, in state socialism, in Leninism, Maoism, etc., 
uh, and to Marx himself as well, it, it's kind of sufficient for you to be a revolutionary uh, as if you have the correct material relationship. So if you're a working class person, say, or you have a material interest in the working class doing well. Uh, and uh, as a second key component, you have the correct communist consciousness, right? So you, for example, you have read a lot of Marx, you broadly agree with what he says. Those things basically make you a good revolutionary. You have a material interest in the working class and you have consciousness that is based on thinking and theory. And then with those two ingredients, you're kind of finished as a revolutionary. You can go out and do your thing. Um, and that's the basic assumption of, of a state socialist. Whereas in prefigurativism, uh, praxis plays a much, much bigger role. Here, having knowledge and having a material interest is not sufficient. It's important, but it's not sufficient. Uh, you also um, need to have the kind of learning that you can only really acquire through practic practicing something in real life. So in this view, um, social change is much more similar to, for example, playing this beautiful instrument, the cello, um, or um, cycling or driving a car, uh, than it is similar to, for example, doing maths. So the idea is that you don't just have to understand the principles of something, which you absolutely do when you learn an instrument, for example. You have to understand musical theory, you have to understand in theory what it is you're doing. But if someone just gave you a book about musical theory um, and then gave you a cello, it wouldn't mean that you would instantly know how to play the cello. You would have to actually sit and practice, even if you have quite a sophisticated idea of how it works in theory. Um, you still have to sit for many, many hours and practice how to do it because you have to learn the particular muscle movements. You have to learn how hard to press with your fingers. You have to develop calluses in your fingers in order for the fingers not to hurt and so on. And the idea here is the same when it comes to revolution uh, for prefigurative politics. So let me use an example of uh, democratic decision-making. So um, say that we here um, at, in this uh, class, for example, say that we were an, a democratically participatory democratic organized group. Okay, and um, every week we have a general assembly where we sit together in a circle and uh, we make decisions about everything that concerns us. Uh, you know, we make decisions about absolutely everything together. Um, and so it's, it's the weekly meeting, we're sitting together in a circle and we're trying to make a decision about whether we should spend some money on um, getting a wheelchair accessible ramp or whether we should buy a new air conditioner. Okay, so we, we have to make a decision about which of these options to go for. We have a limited pot of money to spend. Uh, if we make the wrong decision, then it will have bad consequences for our group because we won't be able to you know, function in an optimal way. Um, but also if we disagree and become angry with each other and fall out, that will also have negative consequences for our group, right? Because people will not like each other and it will become more difficult to work together. So we're sitting in the circle. We have these different um, proposals for what to do with the money, wheelchair ramp or air conditioning. I want you to think about what kinds of skills would you want a person to have who's sitting in the circle? So think about the kind of things that they should ideally be good at. I don't know if the mic will work, but feel free to shout out things if you can think of any. Open-minded. Being open-minded. Couldn't quite hear that one, sorry. Active listening. Yeah, active, active listening. listening. Yeah, absolutely. You would probably need to be good at reading, reading quite advanced stuff. You might need to have some basic accountancy skills, very basic accountancy skills. You probably need to be patient, communicative, so that you can communicate clearly with the other people in your group. It would be really good if you were aware of 
any kind of obstacles that might be in the room for other people, you know, like maybe they're having emotional stuff going on. Um, I'm not saying you have to be aware of what emotional stuff they have going on, but it's good if you're aware that people might have stuff going on and what, what that might mean for you, that maybe you should be more patient or maybe you should be more understanding. Uh, people might have different access needs in the group as well. Um, some people might be <laughs> like me, really happy to talk lots. Some people might be a bit shyer. And so you might need some kind of methods to try to make those people feel more comfortable to speak so that they don't get marginalized. You know, it's a whole range of skills that you need in order to do democracy. It's not like you can just set a rule. Now we're democratic, bam, and that's it. You know, you, you have to hone in all of these skills. You have to practice all of these skills. So that's why uh, praxis is so important to prefigurativism. Uh, you really miss out if you don't build the skills that you need, build the abilities that you need uh, through doing it in practice. Okay, and the final of the three main assumptions, intersectionality. Uh, this here was the best picture that I could find that I think illustrates what intersectionality is. Um, it is basically the idea that you have multiple forms and multiple expressions of social structures that all intersect with each other in different ways and at different points for different people. So it doesn't assume that class is the single key uh, thing that determines how much power you have in life. But there are other things as well, like race, gender, disability, age, uh, and other things that we find even difficult to categorize. So in theory, there can be as many different structures that intersect. I mean, in theory, I suppose they're all part of the same thing. We're only using these words like class and gender and race and so on. We're only using them as analytical tools. Uh, I don't think anyone really claims that they're separate. Uh, but as a way to try to understand how they differ for different people, we use these analytical concepts. Um, and intersectionality, I think, has been so misunderstood by so many people. It's actually, I think, a relatively simple concept. It's basically the idea that any person's uh, access to power and any person's ability to do stuff depends on where they find themselves in this matrix of different intersecting structures. Okay, I will admit that doesn't sound simple at all, but I think it's a reasonably simple concept if, you, if you're used to thinking about social structures. Um, it, 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 there are so many misunderstandings to think that intersectionality is the same as identity politics. Not true. Um, there are people who think that some people are intersectional people, where, whereas other people are not intersectional people. Also not true. Um, so everyone has an intersectional position in, in a matrix of different structures. Uh, it is just a way of explaining that you can't say that, for example, all middle class people are this way or all white people are that way. You know, it depends. It depends on what else you have going on in your life. So very much a direct influence from, especially from black feminism, of course, it was Kimberly Cranshaw who came up with this term and it was the Combahee River Coll Collective uh, in the early 70s, I think it was, um, who wrote a lot of theory to influence this uh, concept. Uh, but really from the rest of uh, decolonial and anti-colonial theory as well. This idea that we can't simply focus on class, we have to focus on all the other forms of inequality as well, if we're serious as socialists, if we're serious about creating an egalitarian society. And that basically means, you know, you can't just go up to the government and say, hi, um, I would like you to please not have class exploitation and also not have gender exploitation and also not have racism and also not have um, disability exploitation. You know, you, you kind of can't do that. <laughs> like the, the state would just like, like the state's brain would explode. Um, just like our brains are probably exploding when we're thinking about this concept. Um, it is too complex for any specific like group of policy proposals for the state to handle. So really the only way is to start creating alternatives where instead of changing this policy and this policy and this policy through the state, you create like a whole new way of relating that takes all of these things into account. And that is why 
being the change you want to see makes sense. Or it's one of the reasons why it makes sense. All right. Yeah, so those are the basic main assumptions of prefigurative politics. Uh, those are the things that underlie it as a, an approach to social change and revolution. Um, so if you agree with those assumptions, then you probably think that um, prefigurative politics is a, quite a, is a strength, right? Is a strong, uh, persuasive approach. If you disagree with those assumptions, like a lot of people do, uh, you, pro you probably don't think it's a very uh, persuasive approach. Uh, but, but I want to highlight a few other strengths and limitations here in addition to that. So the first thing I want to say about strengths is um, I want to bring up a picture here of it's a bit of a weird picture. I was trying to illustrate um, a famous illustration from the human geographers, J.K. Gibbs and Graham. They have one name, but they're actually two people uh, writing as uh, under one name. Uh, and it's a picture of an iceberg. Uh, it's a, a concept that they often use when they're writing about capitalism. And they say that capitalism is simply the tip of the iceberg of the forms of economy that exist in our society. They were, one was American uh, and one was or is Australian. So they're talking about Western societies in general. So capitalism is the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so to me, uh, prefigurative politics is really good in this way. It shows that actually um, the oppressive, hierarchical, exploitative relationships that we are against when we engage in prefigurative politics, we start to realize that they're only actually part of what's going on. I mean, they might be the majority of what's going on or, or around about half of what's going on according to J.K. Gibson Graham, um, but there certainly is an alternative. I don't know how many people here are old enough to remember Margaret Thatcher, the British prime minister in the 1980s. Uh, she had this famous quote, there is no alternative. There is no alternative to capitalism. There is no alternative to neoliberalism. Um, but prefigurative politics does show there is an alternative, actually, there are other ways that we can do something. There are other ways of having economy, they are not ludicrous, they actually work. I mean, they're not perfect either, but um, they are serious contenders, actually. Uh, like a large enough group of people are trying other ways uh, in this world, and are finding that it works uh, quite well. Uh, I, I, last time I looked at the figures, the uh, unofficial United Nations report says that 16% of the global population are a member of a co-op, a cooperative. 16% is not like absolutely massive, but it's also not tiny. I mean, 16% of the world's population, a member of a co-op. I think that's, that says something. Uh, JK Gibbs and Graham themselves uh, claim that around 40 to 50% of all of the economic relations that exist in society are not capitalist, right? are not waged even, uh, which is a lot, that's a huge amount. Um, and not all of those will be, you know, nice communist alternatives, far from it, uh, but quite a few of them are. But nevertheless, I don't know if we agree on the specifics of these figures here, it doesn't matter hugely, but I think the main strength of prefigurativism is it shows that there is an alternative. It shows a different way of doing things. It shows that it's possible um, and it creates the capabilities that we need in order to seriously try to change society. To get into limitations, there are many criticisms that I hear uh, against prefigurative politics that I, I think are often a little bit exaggerated, only partially accurate, but I think we can still learn from them. So I wanna bring them up here. First one is the critique that prefigurative politics comes at too high a cost. Like it's too difficult to get involved with it. Like for example, setting up a cooperative is not exactly something you just do overnight in the same way that you could definitely quite easily decide to go to a protest tomorrow and you can just go home and write something on a piece of cardboard and then you go in the next day, it's quite easy to get involved. Um, whereas with prefigurative politics, um, there's quite a lot more cost, I mean, not necessarily financially, but sometimes financially. So it's more difficult to get involved and therefore it's bad. Um, to which I would say um, it can be more difficult, can be more expensive, but 
I think it's not really fair to apply that criticism to prefigurative politics if you don't also apply it to any other approach to social change. I mean, sure, going along to a protest is quite easy, uh, just like, I don't know, buying something from a co-op is quite easy. That doesn't mean that you're going to change the world just by doing that, you know. Um, no significant social change has ever come out of one single protest. Uh, so the, the, the cost of uh, taking state power, for example, is also very high. Um, yeah, but it is true that prefigurativism does cost in time and, and effort as well as money sometimes, but so do all forms of revolutionary activity. Uh, a lot of people complain that it's not a comprehensive strategy, like you can't only do prefigurative politics because that means you miss out on a lot of other important aspects of social change. This is absolutely true, and no prefigurativist, who's serious uh, at least, claims that prefigurativism is the only, uh, the only true strategy. In fact, I would say all of the main, both theorists of prefigurativism and organizations that uh, practice prefigurativism today, like the Zapatistas I mentioned earlier, uh, Café Libertad that I visited in Hamburg is, is another good example. Um, uh, there are many others as well. All of them combine uh, different strategies and approaches to social change. So all of them also try to seek, uh, try to seize state power. Many of them also even try to reform the state through running for office, for example, and doing prefigurativism at the same time. So these are not mutually exclusive in any way. Uh, other people complain that uh, prefigurative politics doesn't address structural problems, that is too navel gazing. If you go and create a co-op, for example, uh, where you, uh, like the housing co-op I was talking about earlier in, in Hamburg, well that's awfully nice for the people who live in that building, but it doesn't help other people on a broader scale, right? It only helps the people who are involved in the prefigurativism themselves, it doesn't actually address the broader structural inequality that you could address through seizing state control. That's how the critique goes. Um, my response to that is that this basically understands, uh, basically misunderstands, I should say, uh, fundamentally how uh, power works and how structures work uh, according to prefigurativism, uh, as, we've, as I've just gone through. Uh, power is much, much more complicated than just being able to make a law in the government and things will therefore automatically change. Uh, indeed, I would say that a structural change is a change in the fundamental building blocks of something. So I would say that a corporation uh, that is uh, um, capitalist and that is owned by private individuals who are driven by a profit incentive and where the workers don't own any percent of the uh, corporation, but who work for the lowest wage possible, basically the definition of a basic uh, capitalist company, um, that is structurally different from a cooperative where everyone is uh, on equal terms, one person, one vote, everyone shares the uh, proceeds that come from the business equally, uh, everyone makes decisions equally. So we have a fundamentally structurally different type of organization. So this to me is what structural change means, uh, rather than trying to change this policy or the other uh, with the government, I don't think that often addresses structural problems at all. Um, but it is important to remember, you know, the importance of expanding what you're doing and trying to link out to, with other people and reaching out beyond just your individual interests. Of course, you want to do as much outreach as possible, uh, organize together with other prefigurative organizations. Now, I need to finish very soon. Uh, in fact, I will not talk about this. I just wanted to say something about the future to try to leave on a slightly more po positive note. Um, so the prefigurativism has really been growing in the last 20, 30 years, I would say. Uh, but I think there's been some, some significant changes happening even since the COVID era. Um, and uh, these pictures on the left here are pictures from my local COVID mutual aid group. I don't know if you had uh, 
COVID mutual aid groups in Greenville as well, or if any one of you were involved in them uh, in anywhere that you're from originally. Um, but for the first four or so months of the COVID pandemic here in London, uh, people were basically being kept alive thanks to these mutual aid groups. Um, mutual aid groups are a very tr um, old and traditional form of organizing within uh, anarchism. It is when people come together and try to see to each other's needs through mutually helping each other out. So if you need something done, people will help you. And then when they need something, you can help them as well. And it's done on a completely open basis. As it says on the flyer in bold, we want nothing in return. So we put these flyers out all across our local neighborhood and um, people use that number to request different services. And the picture on the left is some of our volunteers donating um, PPE uh, safety equipment to our local hospital because the local hospital ran out and several times we had to dig out swimming goggles and random stuff uh, from our garages to donate to the local hospital. Um, so we saw an absolute spike, I think, in prefigurative organizations during the COVID era. And I think a lot of them are remaining. And uh, to look ahead to the future, I think sadly, you know, we're looking at a period of prolonged chaos, if not per permanent chaos because of climate change. Uh, we've already seen prefigurative organizations like Occupy Sandy, for example, um, being very prominent in, in helping people survive these climate chaos, uh, climate crisis situations. Uh, and I think um, the more we go into climate crisis, the more we're going to see mutual aid groups, the more we're going to see prefigurative organizations, it's purely out of survival, really, um, but also um, out of a, a deep need and desire to change things radically. Yeah, so, so that's where I see prefigurativism going in the future. I think it's, uh, I think it's um, for, for both positive and, and depressing reasons, I think it's going to keep growing. Uh, I think that's all the time that I have for now. So I want to hand over to you if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, reflections, uh, you are warmly welcomed to share them uh, now. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, I see some hands up. Uh, Ms. Lau, let's begin with you. Okay, so this is perhaps a bit tangential to the main course of your argument, but you mentioned that intersectionality and identity politics are substantively different things. And I think most people in this room, if I had been to guess, including myself in part, assume that they were very similar, if not the same thing. And you kind of start building out the argument of their difference, and you say that you can't say all middle class people are all white people are one way. You say identity based proposals are oftentimes insufficient, and identities are kind of analytical constructs. But could you perhaps build out this argument of difference between these two phenomena a little bit farther? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the by the way, one of the best pieces of writing on identity politics at the moment is Assad Haider's uh, Mistaken Identity. Um, he's one of the editors of Viewpoint magazine, Assad Haider. Um, so I would say that uh, identity politics and intersectionality are fundamentally different approaches to social change. Um, identity politics come from, comes from more, a more liberal tradition and it tends to be about assimilating people into the existing structures whereas intersectional approaches tend to be about changing those structures themselves. So intersectional approaches tend to be about, if we go back, for example, to the Kombahi River Collective, um, who first uh, started talking about, ironically, they used the word in identity politics <laughs> to describe this. Um, so I can see where the general confusion comes from. Uh, but they use the word identity politics to show the importance of understanding uh, that power is more complex than just being about class. And they were doing this uh, not as a, a collective of people trying to become assimilated into um, existing power structures. They were not trying to become elected, to become you know, corporate elites uh, or anything like that. Uh, they were trying to overthrow um, you know, the existing power structures. So um, their politics was, uh, a radical politics that was about shifting 
uh, existing structures rather than assimilating themselves. Um, so liberal identity politics tends to be more about kind of, um, I can't help but express myself in a very biased way about it, but in a sort of tokenizing way, you know, like um, in the sort of way that, oh, once we have Obama as president, that means that racism is over sort of thing, because we can assimilate somebody who's not from a traditional political class into uh, the political system, which doesn't in fact change the system at all. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I had a few questions. So one of them was related to a term that kind of loomed in the background in opposition to prefigurism. So like, what, what is capitalism? But I was wondering, prefigurative politics, if I understood correctly, is about slow change saying, all right, this is a change I'd like, I'd like to see. Let's start doing it right now. Let's, let's do this thing. And then people will see that as an alternative. They'll come. What's to prevent that from almost being like co-opted by capitalism? Like that kind of uh, change just continuing to exist like a, with that mutual aid thing. What's to prevent you guys from like, you know, going around buying PPE from capitalist providers and then donating it, which is a very nice thing to do. But what's, you know, the spark that takes it from this being like what's the spark that makes those small changes not just exist under capitalism, but like eventually become like, oh shoot, let's do this other thing. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, it is kind of an open question to, to an extent. Um, so I, I don't know if my answer will be satisfactory, but I will do my best. Um, I think it comes down to the question of what it is you're trying to pre prefigure. So every single prefigurative institution an organization that I've ever been a part of or that I've ever studied uh, or that I've ever read about, um, they have had some form of relationship to capitalism, of course. They have existed in within a broader capitalist society. Um, because if they didn't, then, you know, the most prefigurative, as it were, the most prefigurative possible thing you could do, if you would have to completely de-link is the term that I use in my PhD, which is about international trade. You know, if you could do, if you could have the most radical way of being possible and everything you did was super egalitarian, you know, or every single atom you ate was organic and so on, uh, then you would probably have to basically move out into the middle of nowhere in a forest on your own, you know, so that you don't, so that you're not tainted by capitalism and sort of live off of the blueberries there or something like this, right? And, and that might be nice if you're into that sort of thing, but what that does is that takes away the revolutionary potential because it delinks you from the system that you're trying to change. So there's kind of a tension between, on the one hand, you're trying to do stuff differently and you're trying to not be that thing that you're against, but at the same time, you're trying to still sort of be part of that thing that you're against because you're trying to change it. So there's always a tension between these two things. And every single organization I've ever known um, has had to negotiate these, this tension. So, for example, the coffee traders and roasters that I was talking about, um, the transporting company, the shipping company they use is a normal capitalist company. So in the production of their coffee, they rely on capitalist organizations as well, you know, because they simply can't afford to buy their own ships or to kind of, you know, construct their own shipping uh, organization, right? Um, so yeah, it depends on what you're trying to prefigure. I think you have to choose specific things for your organization or for your project and focus on those things. Uh, so, so it's largely about intention, I would say, a about outcome also, but really what the, the spark that, uh, that you mentioned, I think it's about the intention of which specific things you're focusing on. Um, because everything we do, if you take a capillary understanding of power, everything that we do is constructing tomorrow's world, right? Everything, like, everything I eat today will affect how I feel this evening or tomorrow. Everything I say will affect the things that come back to me and so on. So like everything that we do shapes the world around us. So everything is in a way prefigurative, except most of the, most of the things we're not in control of because we simply can't uh, de-link from from like everything because then we will end up being that person with the blueberries in the <laughs> in the woods uh, yeah I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer but that's where I am with it at least 
uh, in my own thinking at the moment. Good, good, good. We have time for uh, we have one more minute. One more question, Ms. Money. I, I couldn't hear fully what you were saying, but I think the question was, how would I define revolution? Yeah. Um, so there's a really good definition in, in fact, I happen to be standing right next to it. This is one of my favorite books on prefigurative politics. It's called Oppose and Propose uh, by Andrew Cornell. Really handy little book. Um, it talks about a specific case study of an organization called Movement for New Society, uh, which was active in the 80s. And they came up with this definition of, of revolution. That is, uh, when people disengage from, or when people, actually the specific term they used is, when people withdraw consent from current society, when people withdraw consent from whichever is a, uh, social structure they're against, that is revolution. So this could happen on a small scale. You can have your own personal revolution. You, you withdraw consent from something by refusing to be part of it, for example. Uh, or it could happen on a large scale, although I, I personally find it unlikely that everyone will do withdraw their consent from capitalism, for example, at the same time. So I don't really envisage a revolution as an event. I envisage it um, as a, a broader uh, process. Um, so that might, in, in turn, that might open the question, well, how come I say it's revolution rather than reform? Um, but I think, it, to me, the difference is not really, uh, or the key aspect is not really about the pace. I mean, I, I don't disagree with the pace of, of reformism. Uh, I, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy to agree with that. But what I disagree with is um, the lack of radical shift in reformism, right? So uh, the sort of tinkering with the small details. Um, so I would define revolution as um, withdrawal of consent, and I would see it as a process that will happen a little bit here, a little bit there. It would be nice, nice as an understatement. It would be humane to you know, this world and every single species living on it, if that could happen on a large scale fairly soon. Uh, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think it will. All right, thank you, Dr. Sofa Graydon for this. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks.